Commissioner Pransky, building and zoning, 8 p.m. as scheduled. Yes, <laughs> give or take. Uh, but, but Commissioner Zygmuthel, I want to commend you. Uh, the haircut and the meeting were much more streamlined. Um, call, calling the meeting to order at, I uh, have 8.46. Uh, we have several items on the agenda, and I think we can get through them fairly expeditiously. Uh, item one is action on zoning hearing board agenda for March 8th. Uh, it's appeal number 21-3664. Oh, look, it's Calvary Presbyterian Church <laughs> at 213 Fernbrook Avenue. Now, should we lead off with our uh, building and zoning uh, genius, Mr. Sikawango, or did you some, something you want to opine before we start? <laughs> no, we can jump right in. Uh, again, this got a favorable recommendation from the, zone, uh, from the planning commission to the zoning hearing board. All right, since it's so far starting favorable, Mr. Conover, do you have something you want to add to that to change our mind? I have nothing to add to that to change your mind in <laughs> any way, shape, or form. We're any other comments on that? Okay, then keeping it brief in line with Mr. Zygmunt Feld's meeting, uh, I don't see us needing to take any action on this, and I would so move. All those, uh, so what do we, so move, no action. All those no. in favor of no action, say aye. 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 I don't, was that fast enough for you, Mr. Conver? I am very impressed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, very much. Thank you oh. for sticking around. Because it was eight o'clock right on the nose. All right. <laughs> Item 1B, PV Asset Management LLC for 8116 Old York Road Skating Rink. This one will not go as fast. Mr. Sikawango, please enlighten us. Again, uh, counsel for the applicant is, is online. Uh, this was before the Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission raised several concerns uh, that are highlighted in the minutes, some of which um, I, I'm not going to go into the details because we have those uh, for the sake of time. But uh, the... the uh, the recommendation from the uh, planning commission was uh, on a vote of three to two uh, for approval of, uh, of a recommendation for approval of this uh, application. Planning commission voted to approve this. Okay. Um, Just to clarify, it was it was three in favor and two abstentions. Yeah. Correct. Correct. All right. Uh, there is a lot of conversation amongst board members about about this. I'm assuming, Ms. Farrell, you want to present something to us. I do, Amy. yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Amy This Farrell would be with, the time. <laughs> Amy, Amy Farrell with Kaplan Stewart. We are, of course, the attorneys uh, for the applicant here. Uh, we have, I want to introduce our team to you first, and then we'll go through the, uh, the proposal, um, and then, of course, answer any other questions that you might have. Uh, we have with us this evening, uh, Kim and Cantor, who is with Coverney. They are the proposed developers here. Uh, John Alinikov and Tung To Lam, who are both with Bowler. They are the civil engineers for this project. Paul Going, uh, who is our uh, traffic engineer from Atlantic Traffic. James Dankovich, who is the project architect from BWD Architects. We also have Adam Gillespie from Avis and Young. Adam is a broker and will speak to some of the um, difficulties relative to uh, development of this type of site in this location. Uh, we have Eric Hetzel, who is a planner, uh, who will speak uh, generally to some planning concepts and uh, as well to some of the fiscal impact or potential fiscal impact here. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Pulley, Phil Pulley, uh, who is the property owner, is also on this evening and, and uh, has some additional comment to make. Um, and there he's waving now. Hi, Mr. Pulley. Uh, so I'm going to, I believe I have the ability to share my screen. I'm going to go ahead and do that um, and walk you through the general proposal. Uh, and then again, certainly we can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so again, this is the, uh, the proposal for the former Old York Road uh, skating rink that everyone of course is very familiar with, uh, tucked back in the back here uh, along uh, Church and Old York Road, Wall Park, um, <clears throat> excuse me, down, uh, downhill from here uh, to the north, the Elkins Square Shopping Center uh, to Elkins Park Square, excuse me, shopping center to the east, SEPTA train tracks uh, to the rear. A couple of things that are really, um, I think, important to note, particularly from a zoning perspective with respect to this property. Uh, this is, as you can see from this red outline, um, I think the very definition of an irregularly shaped parcel. Um, it is a little over an acre, 1.225 acres. It has no direct frontage to a public street. Uh, the closest public street is um, 
um, actually is out at, at Church Road. Bosler Road is considered a service road. Uh, it, the access to this property is over the adjoining um, office building off of Bosler Road. So no street frontage uh, on a public street whatsoever and no direct access uh, to a street um, other than through an easement uh, across this um, existing office building parcel. There is a secondary um, easement uh, to the sort of what we would call sort of the east of the of the property that is service only. Um, that easement is for use of the Zamboni and storage of, of ice chips. Uh, there's an additional agreement uh, in place that was put in place at the time that these, this property um, or specifically that the Elkins, uh, Elkins Park Square property was developed that also allows for emergency access. And we, we can get into that a bit in a moment. Um, we won't need that moving forward. Um, as you can see uh, from the outline here of the property versus the development and the improvements, uh, portions of the building and the accessory storage trailers are over the property line currently, as are portions of the parking. Uh, this is all stoned parking, uh, that's at, portions of which are actually in the riparian buffer. That's all over the property line currently. Um, this property as it stands right now, as it is developed right now, is non-conforming with respect to rear yard, side yard, parking, and riparian setbacks. Um, it is zoned in the MU1, which is the mixed use one district. And it's just to give you a, a sense of, um, I don't know how, how many of you have been up there to ice skate uh, in, in the last few years. We, it's been closed for a couple of years, obviously. Uh, this is at the top here is, uh, entering up from that, uh, through that access easement up from Bosler Road, looking into the site. And the bottom photograph there is if you were to come around behind the Elkins Park Square uh, shopping center, this is what, uh, what you see from the back there. And that's that little uh, access area that, that I was referencing earlier. The proposal uh, as it stands as applied, and I will say um, at the time at which we applied uh, for zoning and it has changed a bit and I'll get into that in a, in a moment, but the overall general proposal is for a multi-storage self-storage or multi-story, excuse me, self-storage facility, portions of which will be underground uh, and, and the balance of which will be above ground uh, with on-site parking. We're providing or proposing to provide 19 parking spaces. There's also a proposal for a small uh, commercial or retail area unrelated to the storage use. Uh, we, we are sort of anticipating that that could be um, a, local, uh, a local business owner who wants to operate perhaps a coffee or an ice cream shop, something seasonal there that could tie uh, to access to Wall Park. Um, that really came out of some early discussions with the township about um, obvious desires to see some retail up here um, if we could make it happen. Um, we would be maintaining access across that existing easement out to Bosler Road. Um, we are overall reducing uh, impervious coverage, increasing rear yard and side yard setbacks, and increasing the parking setback. Significantly, all of the development will be within the property lines now. So all of the, uh, all of the existing conditions that happen uh, currently beyond the existing property line, that all goes away. Uh, the property gets cleaned up overall, um, completely rebuilt. So the ice rink and everything associated with it comes down and a new building is built in its place. Um, another uh, component of this that we've been talking to the township about is replacement of the old footbridge uh, to Wall Park. That's actually not on the ice skating property. Uh, the easement is uh, just off of the property onto the adjoining um, office building property. However, because that easement is in place, we have, you know, we have indicated the township our willingness to, uh, to reconstruct that footbridge to provide access up. If that's something the township wants to see, um, we would just, of course, need cooperation uh, from the township and the adjoining property owner uh, to make that happen. So um, as I said, as applied um, at the time at which we applied for zoning, um, we had uh, what you see as the plan on the left which required a series of variances. Uh, the self-storage use itself requires a variance. There was a uh, request for uh, building coverage variance. We were gonna be a little over that 60% requirement. Uh, there was a side yard encroachment uh, variance along the side here. 
Uh, we were a little better than what's there right now, but we still were uh, within the five feet that's permitted. There's a variance for uh, building height and it's actually for the number of stories. Uh, the way that the ordinance reads, um, uh, 45 feet of building height up to three stories is permitted. We're within 45 feet of, feet of building height, but it's in four stories. So we would need a variance not to exceed the 45 foot limit, but to provide four stories rather than three. There's a small uh, zone two riparian encroachment and, and um, I'll ask John in a moment to, to describe that in a bit more detail. And again, a small steep slope encroachment uh, that's related to uh, some of the steep slopes uh, or existing slopes along a portion of the property. The property does slope substantially uh, from the back corner down towards uh, Bosler and, uh, and Wall Park. There's also a variance required uh, for parking. We're provoting, proposing 19 spaces where 33 would be required under the strict math of the ordinance. Um, and at the time that we applied initially, we were uh, asking for three wall signs for a total of 270 square feet, whereas the ordinance would allow two wall signs for a total of 200 square feet. There were also two directional signs proposed where one would be permitted under the ordinance. We also have included a request for a determination relative to this parking. As you'll see in a moment uh, from some of the elevations, this parking is at grade level uh, and the building then uh, comes out above that on the, on the levels above. So there's roof essentially over the parking, but it is open uh, on, on the three sides other than the, the side adjacent to the building. The way that the ordinance reads is a little, uh, a little funky there. You could read that as either a parking lot or a parking structure. So we've asked for a determination. If it's a parking lot, we don't need any relief. If it's a parking structure, uh, we do need relief to allow it in connection with this building. And we've asked for that relief. So shortly after we uh, submitted our zoning application, we met with the, uh, the design committee of the township or the development committee, excuse me, of the township um, and had some discussions about uh, the overall proposal. That led to a pencil sharpening uh, 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 process on our end, certainly, um, that I think that we think resulted in some pretty substantial improvements over the initial proposal. We've since met with the planning commission and made even a few more, but as a, um, with respect to the initial modifications that we made coming out of the development committee uh, discussions, the developer made a determination to um, excavate a, uh, more of the basement area of this site, which will allow for some of these storage units to be uh, located in the basement. That allows us to compress the building overall. So we pull it back um, from particularly from the Eastern property line and a bit from the rear property line as well. In doing that, we were able to eliminate entirely the building coverage uh, request for relief. So we're within building coverage requirements. Um, we also eliminated one of the wall signs and one of the directional signs so that the signage complies completely with ordinance requirements. So the variances that remain, as you can see, are the self storage. Again, the number of stories under the building height provision, the small amount of uh, zone two riparian encroachment the steep slope encroachment, parking, and then again, that determination uh, relative to parking lot versus parking structure. Um, at the time we applied, uh, these were the proposed elevations uh, relative to the, uh, to the overall building. Um, we had a lot of discussion uh, with, the with the development committee about signage. Uh, and as I said, we um, ultimately removed one of the three signs that was proposed for the building. Um, and they had specific concerns. We had a lot of discussion about this rear elevation, which is the elevation facing uh, the SEPTA uh, rail, railway. Um, they wanted to see something uh, more robust there and, and something with a, little, a bit more effort um, relative to what folks were gonna see as they were moving by uh, on the train. So we did go back, we made some changes there. Um, the plan that I just laid out with the modifications, the, the overall reduction uh, in, in size and the reduction of the signage was presented to the Planning Commission. Uh, we also proposed to the Planning Commission an updated uh, elevation set, which is the set that you see now. Again, this shows that building being shortened up a bit um, with particular attention on that rear septa rail elevation. Uh, so you can see some increased articulation uh, some differences in materials. And we saw this as an opportunity to identify space on that building where a mural could be done. 
Uh, so something we could work with the community on in the township to find um, a mural artist who could do uh, a mural generally uh, on that rear wall. A couple of the comments that came out of the planning commission um, that led to some still further modifications to the elevations um, had to do with the overall uh, height of the building. When we, uh, when we were talking to the planning commission about this, um, they noticed that some of the portions of the building, this, this corner in particular um, at the, uh, that sort of wraps the, um, the side elevation into the front um, appeared to be above the 45 feet. So we said we were gonna go back and take a look at that. Um, and the other area that they really uh, had some comment on was again, the, the portion facing uh, the SEPTA train track. Uh, that specifically they were concerned about uh, the potential for graffiti uh, along the lowest uh, portion of this wall. And uh, they wanted us to take a look at whether or not we could do some green screening or some other um, treatment along that rear facade to give it a bit more um, depth and a bit more interest. So this is the, uh, the currently proposed elevations that were modified based on some of those planning commission comments. And we did take both of those comments into account. Um, we did go back and take a look at the building height and we realized that once we compressed that building slightly and, uh, and shortened it up a bit to reduce the building coverage, it changed the grades around the building a bit. And when you change the grades around the building, it then changes how you measure height. So the planning commission was correct. That little bump out was going to end up ultimately being above 45 feet. So we've eliminated that so that the, uh, the roof line remains at the 45 foot um, limit that's permitted under the ordinance. The substantial change of course, as you can see again, is along the SEPTA rail there. Um, uh, still proposing uh, some kind of a mural opportunity there, but I think pretty significantly uh, proposing green screening along the entire uh, bottom portion of the, the wall, which will, um, we think will substantially uh, help with um, any, kinds of, any kind of graffiti or uh, potential opportunities for graffiti. And then allowing that green screen uh, up the wall and turning the corner uh, at both the side elevation that would face Elkins Park Square and the side elevation uh, at the parking that faces what is the uh, Pico substation. Um, so that's a, that, those are the changes that we discussed uh, sort of coming out of the Planning Commission's comment. This is an earlier uh, rendering look coming up the, uh, that entry hill there just to give you a sense of, as I was, as I was mentioning earlier, that parking area is covered the building does project out beyond uh, on the upper floors and that gives you a sense of what that, um, what that looks like. And then again, from Wall Park, um, looking into the area with the footbridge being replaced. And again, that's really because we are not, it's a little easier to see here. Um, you can see there's a pretty substantial tree buffer at the, on the property currently and then a, a substantial tree buffer uh, in that grade change along the Tookany Creek uh, as it transitions from the property down to Wall Park, that all stays. Uh, none of that buffer goes away. So this building remains sort of tucked back in here um, and uh, you know, becomes pretty invisible as it were, um, certainly from, uh, from Wall Park and even as you're entering up the entry drive. And you can see that even you know, today as you're coming up, I mean, you're, you have to be right at the edge of the property, this sort of the transition from uh, this macadam to stone where you see right here is really where you first start getting a view uh, of the property, even in its present condition. Um, and we're expecting, of course, that to continue to be the case as we move forward. Um, a couple of other things that we, I wanted to make sure that we do point out, because they did come up in questions, both with the development committee um, and with the planning commission, this building will be fully sprinklered. Um, which is obviously a pretty substantial improvement uh, over uh, the existing conditions that are there now. Uh, we also took a look at ADA accessibility. Uh, as we had discussed with the development committee, there are ADA accessible units uh, on each level of the building uh, on the interior levels. There was a question as to whether or not um, there would also be accessible bathrooms uh, adjacent to those units. We've gone back through and, and taken a look at all that and and that can be done. So bathrooms would be uh, provided on each of those, uh, those unit levels adjacent to the ADA storage units uh, so that um, you know, customers could get to them easily and quickly. Um, there were, as I said earlier on, 
I'm going to stop sharing for a moment um, and let uh, call on a couple of my colleagues here to answer a couple of other uh, specific questions that had come up. And then we certainly can open it up to questions uh, on a broader level. Um, a couple of the items that, uh, that came up during uh, the design or the development committee discussions and then a bit with the planning commission had to do with, um, you know, this is obviously a mixed use district. There's obviously interest uh, in the community, uh, certainly uh, to see some level of retail up here and really to see retail or recreational uh, rather than storage. Could we look at something uh, besides storage? Um, uh, we have, uh, as I said earlier with us this evening, I have Adam Gillespie who is uh, with Avis and Young uh, Adams, uh, I think probably familiar to a lot of you. He was involved with the Elkins estate and has been very involved uh, with other properties uh, in Cheltenham, both on the buyer and the seller side. He's not connected to this, uh, to this development deal. Uh, he's not on either the buyer or seller side here. So I reached out to Adam for what I felt would be an, uh, kind of an independent opinion about uh, retail and what we saw as the difficulty of retail um, on a site like this uh, and even recreational as, as another alternative. Um, so Adam, if you wouldn't mind just a sort of quick summary of um, what you know what what you found and what your general opinion is with respect to that. Yeah, just for for why retail doesn't work in this location, retailers, the most important thing for their business is, signage and access. And the fact that you have to go through a building that already doesn't have good access to get to this one uh, would surely limit you know, who would be interested in it from a retail perspective. Definitely you wouldn't get a, a national tenant, um, probably not even a mom and pop tenant given that there's other locations that they could go within the township that has better access and, and, and better uh, visibility. Um, and just for market, uh, a market comp, the building that you have to pass by to get to this one off of Bosler, which is 8118 Old York Road, um, that sold in 2018 for $35 a square foot. It was on the market for over 600 days. Um, so that, that speaks of the kind of demand for properties that have better better signage, better access um, than this. Um, it, it would be a tough sale to get a retailer, I think, to this location, given the lack of signage and um, lack of access. Thanks, Adam. Um, we do, I, as I indicated earlier, I, I know Mr. Pulley is also on, uh, he's the, the current property owner. He's obviously uh, been operating this site for, um, for a great many years and has had it listed for quite a while. Um, he has some information relative to uh, the interest that he was able to generate um, and the folks that did come and take a look at it and, you know, who and how they were, how long that took and, and why those issues fell through. Mr. Pulley, if you wouldn't mind. You're muted, Thank Mr. Pulley. You're muted. Now I'm unmuted. Good Thank evening. you. Um, to give you guys an over, a quick overview, uh, my wife and I operated the rink since it filed for bankruptcy which was a, more than two decades ago. We kept the rink going for the community. Uh, the property never made any money. We did it out of the goodness of our heart. My mother was an original 1962 bondholder of the rink when she put up her $80. And that's how I got involved when it went into bankruptcy with Commerce Bank. Um, we look for the demographics of Cheltenham Township have changed. The uh, ice sports have also changed. The majority of the ice sports now all are drawn to ice rink facilities that have multiple sheets, a lot more amenities than what the old York road facility has. Uh, even though we've had some of the best teams in the country, we've won national championships, international championships. We just couldn't compete with some of the other bigger facilities. Um, it, Pre-COVID, we looked, uh, we, we kept looking over the years for an exit strategy. We talked to the club about buying it. We've talked to various nonprofits about buying it and maintaining it as an ice rink. Uh, nobody wanted to step up to the plate. We've even talked to a company called Black Bear Sporting, um, who is buying all of the multiple sheet facilities, and they had no interest. Um, over the past two and a half years, we've had an array of people that we've talked to about the property, everything from multifamily, assisted living, daycare, doggy care, um, 
We've had indoor sports facilities look at it. One of the things that is that you can't appreciate from any of the photos is approximately 11 feet above the ice, there are horizontal members that tie one side of the building into the other. As such, it doesn't make it any good for indoor sports, uh, for soccer, uh, indoor baseball academies, or anything like that. So we, we went the entire gamut. Uh, we pitched this to Arcadia University for a for an ice, ice rink for them. Uh, they elected to go to Montgomeryville and buy their ice from up there because we didn't provide uh, the multiple sheet facility. Uh, we talked to various developers. Uh, we talked to assisted living people. We talked to various drug rehab recoveries of America about looking at it and perhaps building some other facility there. The existing building date back to 1956. It's unsprinklered. It has certain structural limitations because of how it was designed in its day. Um, the grading, the absence of parking, the loss of the bridge in two 2010 and the township not replacing it, um, all of those kind of led to the downfall. Um, we have beaten this puppy for two and a half or three years to come up with an alternative use, another option. Um, and the highest and best thing that we were able to facilitate was self-storage. Um, we even looked at indoor storage of cars and everything else, um, from that standpoint and just nothing was clicking. Um, like Adam said, it, it's not a retail location. It's a landlocked piece of property. Um, even from a multifamily standpoint, it puts you almost on the rail tracks, which means that people are going to hear the trains go by every minute of every day. Um, so we, we were extensive. We went on a national marketing campaign. We hired both local and national people to help market it. And this is the highest and best thing we came up with, with the redevelopment of the, of the lot, as well as the area. Thank you, Mr. Pulley. Um, Thank you. another item that came up, uh, during our discussions with, uh, the development committee, uh, had to do with the fiscal impact, both the existing impact uh, at this site and the potential uh, fiscal upsides uh, for redevelopment here. Uh, and as I said, we have Eric Hetzel, who's a, uh, who's a planner and who regularly uh, takes a look at the fiscal impact questions uh, around planning. He also certainly uh, could answer questions that anyone might have relative to the overall development and planning concepts here. But we did ask Eric specifically to look at um, the potential uh, fiscal impact for this type of a project uh, over what's there currently. And Eric, if you would just please summarize for the board um, what you found. Sure thing. Thanks, Amy. Um, good evening to the board. Uh, as Amy outlined, I was asked to uh, evaluate what the potential fiscal impact would be associated with proposed self-storage facility in comparison with the existing use that is there today, the uh, defunct skating rink. And um, not surprisingly, the proposed self-storage self facility would have a, uh, a much higher uh, market value and resulting assessed value than what is there today. Um, and because of that, um, the tax revenues would be significantly higher to both the township and the school district from the proposed use. Um, just broad numbers based on uh, market values of comparable properties and the resulting assessed value that we think it would be assessed at uh, by the county, uh, we're looking at, at um, net positive fiscal revenue impact to the township uh, on the order of about $55,000 per year. And uh, that's compared to um, the existing use generates, uh, according to the Montgomery County tax uh, rolls about $139 per year. That's a significant change uh, to the township tax revenue. Um, and- Mr. Hetzel, does that include the school district and the no, township I was, together? I was going to, uh, to say that next. The school district um, would realize an additional approximately $250,000 in tax revenues per year uh, from the proposed use compared to uh, current revenues on the order of $682 per year. So again, it's a significant increase. Um, we also would consider that this proposed use has very few uh, public 
uh, service requirements as far as uh, in, incurring any cost to the township or the school district. Um, there would be a maximum of two employees working there. Um, it'd be, it's privately secured. Um, it's privately, it's sprinklered. Um, there are no school kids that will be generated as a result of this development. So virtually all of the tax revenue to the township and all of the tax revenue to the school district um, would be would, would be available to those two taxing entities with no resulting offsetting costs. Thanks, Eric. Um, sure. I do wanna ask our, uh, our civil engineer, John Alinikov, to, um, to talk a little bit about the, um, the riparian buffer impact in particular and the steep slopes, because I don't, I don't think those come across as well uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. We just wanna to explain to you sort of where uh, where that's happening and what's going on there currently and what that's going to look like um, under this proposal. John, you may wanna, uh, do you wanna share your screen or do you want me to pull up the plan? Uh, it, I'm trying to, and it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if someone- We've can... had enough screen sharing for one night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about if, um, I, if I can share it on mine and- Yeah, um, that'd be You great. should be able to share now. Oh, I got it. Oh, that's even better. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Okay, if everyone just let me know when you can see my screen. We can, thanks. Yep. Oh, okay, great. Um, so I'll start with the riparian uh, corridor setback variants that we're talking about. Um, as some of you may know, the, the creek runs alongside the, the property here. Um, and, and what you're looking at in terms of the requirements of the zoning ordinances are two zones. Zone one is a 25 foot uh, offset and zone two is a 75 foot offset. Um, and the way the ordinance reads is that um, for zone two, you're required uh, the greater of the 100 year floodplain elevation or 75 feet. Um, as you can see on the plan here, this floodplain elevation, which is the 100 year floodplain is located entirely outside of our site. Um, and in fact, we only have a small portion of our site that actually borders that creek there. Um, so what you're left with is the 75 foot per the strict interpretation of that ordinance. And I'm tracing along here uh, this 75 foot line and where it cuts across the property. Um, one of the things to kind of realize uh, with where this is, is this is the access to the property. And all of this area as it stands today is either a mix of gravel or paved. So it is already impervious in nature. Um, in addition, uh, we're not proposing to change that because of how access is taken to the site for one. And secondly, there is a PICO property that has some PICO equipment adjacent to us. And there's an, a, an access easement across from it that they still need uh, access through, which would necessitate this area in here remaining uh, some sort of gravel or impervious coverage in nature. So that kind of shows you where, where this property and what can and can't be done in that area. Um, with regards to the steep slopes in here, as I just get rid of this red line, um, the steep slopes on this plan are called out by this hatching that's here. And you can see there's different um, kinds of hatching to denote different areas of steep slopes. And really where the majority of it occurs is at the front of the property. And a large reason for that is a big portion of this property is existing building that's towards the rear. Um, so what you're looking at is in this area, uh, where that wooded area that Amy referenced before, which we are certainly, our, our hope and goal is to maintain that wooded area as a nice buffer between our use and adjacent properties. Um, and then along the frontage here, uh, where practically speaking, if you're going to develop this property, there's going to be some sort of disturbance to these steep slopes. So what we've tried to do is keep it to a minimum. Um, however, there, there are some disturbances that are gonna happen. And as part of the zoning ordinance, in order to have a use um, located within existing steep slopes, it is a variance. Are those slopes man-made or natural? No, I, I, I would say that these slopes have been here for so long, they were probably man-made at some point in order to get this building in here, because certainly as you're going to, as this building was originally constructed, um, it's certainly possible that these slopes are created maybe from some excess um, soil from excavation, something of that nature. Um, but I don't believe that the ordinance makes a strict distinction between those two. 
Correct, which is why we've asked for that relief. Um, and John, even though it's not really a, a zoning issue, if you could just speak a little bit to uh, to stormwater management, because that did, a, a, again, come up um, at the Planning Commission meeting as well in terms of what's there now versus uh, the steps we would have to take with respect to stormwater. Uh, certainly, oh, I've gotten a, uh, an error message on here, so hopefully everyone can still see things. Um, stormwater, as it exists today on site, there is, uh, to my knowledge, nothing out there. Um, survey doesn't really show anything. Um, so site runoff would be really concentrated flow that would then um, concentrate and then go directly into the creek. It's part of our requirements. We would obviously have to do stormwater management in, uh, in compliance with the township standards. And should we exceed an acre of disturbance, we would have to go then for an NPDES permit, which also has its own levels of um, stormwater management that we would be required to meet. Great, thank you. Um, if you wanna, you could go ahead and stop sharing if you'd like. Um, and I do, I just have uh, one other um, uh, one other component of this to, to speak to and that really has to do with the parking. Um, as I indicated, we are asking for a variance uh, to reduce the overall parking required on site uh, to 19 spaces. Um, as I said, we have Paul going, uh, who's with Atlantic Traffic. He's a traffic engineer uh, who has taken a look at um, and is familiar with, uh, with these types of uses in general, but has taken a look specifically here uh, at the parking demands and the anticipated parking demand. And he can speak a bit to uh, the justifications relative to that variance. Paul, if you would, please. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so we, if you've ever been to or, or use a self-storage facility, you know that when you're there, uh, oftentimes there's no one else there. You have the place to yourself. Uh, there may be a few other people there. Um, parking demand for this type of use is low. It's a low traffic generator and, and a low parking demand generator. So it's, it's really appropriate to this unusual kind of configured and, and located property. My office has conducted parking studies at over 10 self-storage facilities located in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut, in New York, not Connecticut. Um, and we, these sites that we looked at, they ranged in size from 40,000 square feet to 250,000 square feet. And what we found was in uh, the maximum average number of parked vehicles was 11. And what we also found was that that number didn't correlate with the building size. It wasn't, it wasn't proportional to, to the size of the facility. So we, we typically recommend 11 stalls for, for self-storage. And at this site, uh, there are 33 parking stalls required. There are 19 proposed. Uh, seven stalls of the requirement are required for the retail component, the, the 1,200 square feet. Um, with the remainder required for the self-storage. So if we have uh, those seven stalls earmarked for the retail from the 19, that leaves 12, which is, which is greater than the 11 that I, that I mentioned we, we get from our research. So I, we believe that the amount of parking is actually appropriate uh, for the use. Great, thank you, Paul. Thanks. Uh, that's the, the overall, I'm sure you're probably sick of listening to us and I, I suspect you all have some questions for us. So um, I'm happy to pull anything back up that perhaps somebody would like to see or just uh, generally answer questions as you have them. Okay, is that the, that, that's the end of your presentation at this point, Ms. Harrell? Yes. All right. I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank you for the people who have joined you for tonight. Uh, as always, You've done a very professional and thorough job presenting your client's point of view. And if ever I need to present a silk purse, you will be on the list of people I call. Um, I'm glad you appreciated that, Mr. Rappaport. Um, the this is the third self-storage project that's come to us about this property. Um, and when we spoke to the last two, I'll, I'll say to you the same thing we said to them. Uh, the inclination is against this kind of a project. You back up to a public park and this 
basically adds nothing to the ambiance or improvement of the neighborhoods or the park situation. Um, all the commissioners I know have something or most of them have something to say about this. It will pretty much reflect the same view uh, from different perspectives, um, but there is nothing in your application that actually meets zoning. Everything from soup to nuts is a variance, everything. The, the use, the size, the need, everything, you know, you say, well, we kept it with under 45 feet. Okay, but, you know, it's still 45 feet of something that is a silk purse. Um, I'm gonna open it up to the other commissioners uh, and then uh, probably there's some public comment because I've received numerous emails all saying, this is not a good idea. This is next to our park and we're not looking for this. So rather than me go through a, a litany of things. Uh, I'm going to open this up to the commissioners with any comments they might have. Commissioner Norris. Yes. Uh, so i hopefully an easy question. Uh, I'm interested in uh, what the current uh, sale price for the property is. And when the owner mentioned uh, that this was the highest and best offer, um, can you give us some indication as to other offers that you might have received that were less than the highest and best? So, so let me clarify. I believe what he was saying was the highest and best use, not the highest and best financial offer. Um, we don't provide uh, the financial terms of an agreement like this, um, particularly before something has closed, because if this deal does not move through, it really does unfairly um, burden Mr. Pulley. Uh, if he has to go back on the open market to try to sell this again, he's now out in the public with a number that, um, that he's got to work against. What, what was the asking price? Was that public? That I don't know. Mr. Pulley could answer that question if, if he knows, or if that was public. Mr. Pulley, you're either not answering or you're muted. I was muted again. I apologize. Um, we didn't go out onto the street with an asking price. We had gotten to the point where the only other offer that we had received was $100,000. And that was from a LaSalle uh, high school parent um, who had this dream about putting an ice rink there. Um, other than that, we waited to receive proposals uh, under an RFP fashion, well, almost like a bidding type fashion. Um, and one of the things that had had happened was not only the money that you look at is also the ability to actually facilitate something. Um, there were some other people who had some dreams, but they were first off financially un unreasonable, um, but they also hadn't had any experience in performing anything and getting anything done. Um, so, you know, when they sit there and say, well, I'll go in and I'll ask the township for a change of this or a change of that, they don't understand the amount of f uh, money it takes to go through what, um, these uh, gentlemen are going through, uh, whether representation, engineering, architects, and the like, to come up with a concept that is palatable. Understood. Before we continue, by the way, I meant to thank you, Mr. Pulley, for all your efforts on this ice rink. I am familiar with it since I was a child here in the township and uh, do have some fond memories of uh, hurting myself on the ice. Um, <laughs> but that was my lack of skill. Um, Mr. Ziegenfeld. Okay. Um, so I have questions for a number of you who testify. Mr. Gillespie and, and Hetzel, you both talked about, um, you know, the limitations uh, of retail, but I'm wondering, you know, since, since you, since you opined on, um, on some of those limitations, I'm wondering why you also didn't include a combination of residential retail and self storage that possibly might have more of an appropriate use in that area. Because right now under the, the MU1, um, as Commissioner um, Pransky said, you're basically out of zoning and, and you know, establishing needs and where hardships don't seem to have been explored. So I wanna get a, a better sense of, since you both weighed in on use and on practicality and fiscal impact. I want to understand rather than just doing the comparison of fallow skating rink and self-storage, if you also put something else in the consideration set 
to give it a better potential use that would be more compatible with what the community is looking for? So I, I can address that question. Um, and James, if you could provide some input as well. Um, when you when you have retail and multifamily, you know, slash apartments and a self-storage facility as well, your load capacity per floors are different. Uh, they're a lot higher for self-storage and ultimately it, it's a lot more expensive to build. So when you're coming in as a apartment developer and you're building an apartment building, your cost is X, but you're coming in as a self-storage facility, it's a different cost due to, you know, you can't build tilt up. So, you know, in an apartment building, the first three floors can be wood, right? essentially wood beams as you're building it up. Self-storage, you can't do that. It's a much higher load. You're using steel. It's a lot more expensive, so you can't stack them on top of each other. They're not compatible uses. Okay, but but it, it, there's potentials there in that physical space to compartmentalize it in a different way rather than stacking it. I'm just trying to give you a vision or an image for a you know a use that took into account other aspects and would still be more compatible with both the proximity right. to a recreational area and to an area that probably could use some additional um, combination residential retail and, and to have self-storage because you're proposing 1,234 units. And to me, what that says is it's a clear, you know, inexpensive development, you know, or, uh, you know, a low cost um, construction. And I'm saying to you, well, take on something that's more compatible with the area. So I right. appreciate so that. Uh, just one other comment, and then you can answer me. I know we talked about in the development committee, you showed us some different renderings that would make the property have more of a community centric look rather than something that's so industrial and frankly square and, and really not a very attractive thing. So I'm not seeing, you know, I know to, uh, to Councillor Farrell's comments, you, you paid attention to comments from both the Development Committee and Planning Commission, but I'm wondering if you also entertained just in the concept, trying to make a building that looks a little more friendly and community centered in a place that's in close proximity to a recreational area. You have the little bridge and, and, and the, the sylvan area, the trees, but I'm not seeing all that much in terms of commitment to the aesthetic piece. And I know that we spoke about that a little bit. So feel free to, you know, to answer my question or challenge here. Sure. So to, to the first point, the only way to stagger a mixed use like this would have to have the residential part on the bottom to address your first question. Uh, I'm sorry, residential on top of the self-storage facility due to the load. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me personally, I, I live in house. If I live in an apartment building, I would not want to walk through a self-storage facility to get to my apartment. And that's really the only way to build that. Um, you know, in terms of cost, you know, I'll challenge the point that it's a cheap build. You know, I'm not necessarily going to share my budget here today, but I will tell you, it is certainly not cheap what we're doing. Um, and to and to and to add on that as well, when you start fixing out the aesthetics, meaning we have done what we could, I'll be upfront. These design changes that we've done with the mural and some of the paneling and some of the grinier on top. That's and the, and the basement excavation is costing me north of a million dollars. I'll be very upfront with that. To to try to get the building coverage down and try to address a lot of the comments. To start adding more aesthetics to the building all the way around, and you know James can attest to that as well. It starts to get extremely expensive, and then frankly, it's not worth it for us to do the project anymore if we start to just keep on adding cost and cost. So what we have tried to do is design this building as aesthetically as we can. And we are being stretched, frankly, financially on this development. And we really just, it's, it would be hard to justify doing more. It's just financially not feasible. Okay. Forgive me for the pejorative use of the word cheap. Economical and efficient is more appropriate. And I understand, you know, in your position, that's really what you have to look at. Unfortunately, we can't just look at it from that standpoint because we have to look at it from a whole bunch of community as well as developmental. Sure. As well as and, and, and I don't disagree. And one thing that we are trying to do is, and I know we keep coming back to the retail, is, you know, we're in the business to make money, right? We're, we're in the real estate business, we're developers, we are ultimately here to make money. This retail piece that we have, 
I have, I'm not, I'm not under any delusion that I can even rent this out. Um, I'm not going to rent it out. My goal here is to give it away for free to somebody local, um, you know, a startup, an entrepreneur, whoever it may be, he or she's trying to get something off the ground because I'm aware due to the limitations of the site as Adam and Phil have testified to that there's really, no one's going to come in and pay any money here. And so that just speaks even more to the challenges of the site. You, you know, no retailer is going to come in. And in my mind, we are apartment developers as well. And I'll leave with that. This is the best use we could come up with for this particular site. Um, let me let me move into a different direction. Mr. Pola, you've been at that site, I guess, for many years. It was from 1956. I'm wondering if there's been any soil testing um, in the ice rinks, they used a variety of chemicals. I'm wondering if there is a need uh, for any soil remediation um, and whether any of that has seeped into the creek or into the underlying soil base. And could you, do you know, or has been, has there been any soil testing um, by the folks who are proposing either by you or the folks who are proposing to develop the site? Um, um, Mitch, I think there has been Jim, soil testing Jim and the soil answer that. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we did we did a phase one environmental test and the soil was clean. Okay, good. That's nice to hear. Um, yeah, Amy, you I mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Farrell, you mentioned the reduction of the impervious coverage. Uh, I'm curious uh, how that was calculated. And then knowing that you're putting up a structure like this, um, it, it it would appear to me that you would in fact have um, you're expanding that footprint and having a larger thing. Why wouldn't there be um, more impervious surface over which the rain and some of the other storm elements are going to uh, contribute to a higher level of runoff rather than it's it's a reduction. So help me understand how you, the calculus for that was was uh, determined. Sure, and John can speak to that more specifically since he uh, he ran the numbers. But um, overall, I believe it is a um, a reduction. But John, if you want to go ahead and and you certainly could share screens again if that's more helpful. Yeah, and if you want, I can. But it's simply saying that you know the the existing building goes up to the property lines all the way around, and while we are expanding that building more towards the front of the property, there are some ancillary things, um, things like sidewalks, things of that nature that we are kind of removing that are allowing us, um, and particularly there's uh, areas where parking are out in front of the building that we're removing and proposing to make green that are contributing to that reduction. Okay. And how much of reduction is that? Um, a the, thousand square feet? Uh, with the updated plan, we are uh, showing a reduction of about, three percent impervious um i also had a question about you know the uh impingement on the riparian buffer why do you need that section of the building as part of your footprint why couldn't you you know pull that back so that you have no impingement on that section of the riparian buffer well while, while i would offer that yes the the building is a bit further into that riparian buffer um the existing impervious coverage that is adjacent to that creek area is still there and isn't changing. Um, if anything, it would probably be um, upgraded a little bit by making it a more hardy surface, but it is still impervious and it's still in that location. Okay, I'll ask one more question then I'll leave it to other members of the board. Um, Mr. Goring, you talked about um, the parking space is 19 from what are, you know, from code 33. You mentioned that seven would be quote unquote allocated for retail, which left um, which left 12 for self storage. So what you really have is you have 12 spaces truly allocated for self storage. So you said optimally or characteristically you only need 11, but the truth is by code, we require 33. Uh, and so you're talking about one third of the spaces that would be against our code. So I'm wondering, you know, you may say it, it rarely occurs and a hundred year storms rarely occur, except they happen every five or six years there in Cheltenham. So I'm just wondering, you know, what's the, the rationale or the, the justification for cutting back really two thirds of the, what are uh, 
codify necessary parking spaces, at least from, from the wisdom of what we've had in managing our township. Well, based on the findings that, that from my office, as well as uh, experience working on one to two dozen self-storage facilities, um, they, they really just do not generate that much parking demand. Uh, yeah. I'd like to add that and as the architect, we've done dozens of these facilities as well and find that that amount of parking is a reasonable amount for this size facility. Okay. And, um, and Mitch, I do just want to clarify that that 33 space requirement is the combined requirement for the retail and the self storage under the. No, I understood. Okay. I did. I understood. And I, by the way, I want to thank uh, Amy. I want to thank all you and Mr. Ken. I want to thank all your folks for coming here and giving us, you know, professional input and the best counsel that they could on behalf of your client and whatever comes out of it, know that it's respected that you've brought a, a team of very capable, competent people. So while we try and shoot holes in it, we're also respectful of the fact that they've done the job they're supposed to try and do. Thank you. I, I yield, Mr. Chairman. Okay. You're just doing that to stretch the meeting. I know you, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge, huh? Commissioner Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I may be a little bit of a contrarian um, in relation to this project. Um, before the meeting, I was a little on the fence on where I stood. Um, I believe that the applicant and, and team came in and made some extremely valid points um, in relation to um, the use and the, uh, the issues associated with, with this property. Um, I, I do have some concerns and it's mostly around the design and not so much the use, um, you know, height for that site, you know, the, the, the 45 feet for me or four stories is a little, you know, I feel like is a little, uh, is a little much for that, that area. Um, I would also have concerns about, I know the planning commission, you had a concern about the rear of the building and the aesthetics, you know, for the passersby on the train you know, I, I wouldn't be as as concerned about that, and I would I would rather see the resources utilized uh, on the front side uh, of the building or the the uh, the pieces that the residents uh, will see. Not to say residents aren't commuters because they are, um, but you know I don't know if that's the best use of um, of resources. You know, on on the back side, but you know we could we could debate that. Um, and, I, and I guess my other, my other thought or question would be, um, and I'm sure there was already a study done and maybe someone can speak to sort of the viability of another self-storage facility uh, given the existing self-storage facilities that are already in operation um, in a reasonable radius from, from the site. Yeah, I, I can address that. Is your is your question just so I understand it? Is what's stopping another self storage developer from attempting to develop another facility? No, no, well, it, no it, there, there's it, several it, of them within a mile or so. Yeah. It, okay. How, sure. how viable will this business be? Because if it if it's built and fails, then you know we're stuck with a <laughs> with a failing self storage facility on the site. Sure. Um, so just to not, I don't want to get too technical on the response, but as anything else, self-storage is a factor of supply and demand. Now, self-storage, most people are local. They generally come, generally come from within a three mile radius. Um, you know, you have the project in the middle where you are and, you know, three mile ring around it. And that, you know, 95% of your customers are coming from within within that area. No one's going to drive more than 10, 15 minutes because to, as your point, they'd be driving past other facilities as well. When you look at the demographics of the area in terms of population density, it's pretty dense. Um, now, while you may think um, that, okay, I know self-storage facilities here on Township Line Road, and I know there's one on Ivy Hill Road, um, you, you know, you might think that's a lot, but due to the sheer amount of people, our, in our opinion, it's what we would call a quote unquote underserved self-storage market. So we're not concerned at all if, um, 
that this won't be stopped. Just to give you a data point here, I look at over a thousand self storage potential projects a year. I do two to three deals a year, you know, in, in a good year, maybe four. That's how picky and selective we are in terms of site from a sheer supply, demand, and rent and, and rent drivers. So, you know, I would not come in to try to do a deal if I didn't think this would be an absolute home run potentially for us. Um, if I had not to say that it, that it couldn't, right? Anything happens. Um, but I really don't have any concern of this failing, you know, to be frank, just with how selective we are when we do these projects. We, you know, we look at this for a very long time. We do a lot of analysis. This will be managed by a publicly traded company, almost probably extra space, um, you know, based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. They manage tens of thousands of facilities. You know, one of the things we do is we always go to them and ask them for their input. You know, we've done this a few times, you know, as I like to say, we pretend to know what we're doing at this point. Um, but then again, extra space and cube smart and public storage, they're the experts. So we always go to them. We bring them the project. Is this a project you will manage? You know, get on the phone with them. Do you think this is a good location? There's a lot of legwork that goes in behind the scenes. Um, so I guess to answer your question in a shorter way, um, we're not concerned that this will not lease up. Uh, if I can interject for a moment, uh, Commissioner Holland, um, I have to tell you, in all fairness to you, um, at least four other projects I can recall, Henry, if I'm wrong, it doesn't, by one or two, I'm not worried, have come to the township and four times the people and the residents around it in the neighborhoods and the surrounding community have said, we don't want this. I would imagine if there was the kind of demand you're anticipating that somebody would say, oh, this is a great idea. That has not occurred. And I just thought you should be aware of that. Right. So I'll, I'll sure. So I'll address that point. So um, I should have sent you, uh, <laughs> I, could, I could share this data point with you. Um, I don't have it at my fingertips. About 10% of the country rent self storage facilities, right? So it's actually a, when you think about how many people are in the country, it's a large number. 90% of the people in this area are, you know, aren't necessarily going to utilize it. The 10% will, um, you know, that's, we don't necessarily like, you know, like one of the commissioners mentioned, there's 1,240 units here. When you draw this three mile ring around this facility, you're talking about an excess of 200,000 people. Um, so we, we need a fraction of people to come in and lease this up. I understand, that, but please know, that I am a user of self-storage and every self-storage facility that I am aware of is tucked into an area that does not abut a park where kids play and have baseball games. Um, they're usually buried within another structure or on a heavily traveled commercial highway. And this is why every email I've gotten said that they're not happy with the idea of having that behind their park. And it's not only meeting resistance from them, but I promise you it, it will meet more resistance here. Commissioner Holland, did you have any more things? You, uh, Commissioner Ammon, I'll get to you in a second. I didn't know if I, Commissioner Holland had finished. I, I did not. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Ammon. And then thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, you, you know, the, the, this uh, this board of commissioners, um, you know, to its credit, a accomplishes a lot. But but quite frankly, one of the most important things it seems to me that we can do is to um, in ensure the character of our community uh, at large. And sticking a giant concrete box between a park and a stream. I think runs afoul of that character. Um, the, it, it, all due respect to you, Ms. Farrell, it, it, it is not uh, a hidden, it would not be a hidden structure. R right now you could drive down Church Road and, and see the, the skating rink fr from Church Road through the park, through the trees. Um, so adding several levels of height to that site um, would hardly be invisible. Um, while, I, while I do understand that this, um, 
the 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 small retail space was was the request of of some on the township uh, qu quite frankly it's it, it's almost laughable i mean i i don't i don't think that um we're going to have many residents um being you know talking about going down for for a coffee at the self storage place um I, I just don't see that happening, um, particularly where we have um, lots of other retail in that in that area. Um, the, the, the notion, um, in my view, that uh, there's nothing else that would ever go here, um, it, it, you know, it just doesn't doesn't quite ring true. There, there are um, there are lots of um, businesses. Um, and I'm not a developer, I'm not a real estate person, um, but, but I'm thinking about various venues, um, like in Willow Grove, there's an urban air that is a landlocked facility, a uh, landlocked property in, a, in um, off of uh, Old York Road that um, has very little signage. Uh, and if uh, you ever uh, go there with your kids, um, or, or uh, check it out. It, it's packed to the gills pretty much all the time, um, absent COVID uh, restrictions and, and whatnot. So, um, so the, the notion that nothing else would come in here just doesn't sort of ring true for me. Um, the, 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 the one thing that, that I have um, some, some concerns, of, uh, another thing I have concerns about, I should say, is on the backside um, where, where um, to, to your credit, I think you did pay a lot of attention. Um, it's somewhat of a misnomer to suggest that that's simply abutting the train tracks because just on the other side of those train tracks is a residential community that, that is going to be viewing the backside of this self-storage unit and some big lit up sign, um, which I think is similarly troublesome. There's no um, signage on the back. It, it appeared as though there was there was a there was a self storage banner of some sort. Maybe that's maybe that changed in um, in some of the subsequent designs. Um, but but nevertheless, it, it it would be a big concrete box that they'd be that they'd be looking at, and I assume it's lit at some point. Um, the 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 notion that um, that hey, this is going to be run by a big company out of Salt Lake City is is not not comforting to me either, um, because when there are issues and concerns, the, um, the the two employees who you're going to have on site, um, which, which obviously doesn't bring a lot of jobs to the neighborhood either, um, you know, we're not going to you know we're not going to be able to call Salt Lake City and get get responsive. Um, uh, action to um, concerns by the neighbors. So um, I, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to sort of get that out there. And and I similarly, um, like Commissioner Pransky um, and others, have received a number of uh, concerned emails about this project. And um, and and it's not because it's not because they are um, at averse to business or, or, or making money um, or bringing revenue into this township, it's because um, that revenue should not come at such a great cost that we sort of sell, um, sell our neighborhood out uh, in this sense. So um, I sure. appreciate your indulgence. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Pransky. Thank you, Commissioner. Sure. If, if I can, if I can address some of those points, if the commission, you know, commissioners will indulge me, um, a few of them on the back. Um, we have, we actually did remove the self storage sign from the back. It's not going to be backlit. I mean, it will be security lights, right? But you're not going to have big glaring signs in the back um, that are lit up. You know, re regarding the management company, you know, we generally choose between two management companies. One is actually based out of the Philly area, um, Cube Smart. The other one is based out of Salt Lake City. Um, there's regional managers, district managers, you know, they're international company. It, it, I just want to alleviate your concern that they won't be able to get to the right people um, if something were to happen because there are multiple managers in the area. Um, you know, and they manage facilities across the country. We have facilities in other states. We've never had an issue. 
like any, you know, along those lines. I mean, There's we, always we the have, direct line of communication. We, we have we have Xfinity stores in our neighborhood and, and I can't find a live person until I'm 20 minutes into a phone call. So <laughs> right. So I, our I, stores I have live. I understand your point, but but at the same time, uh, I, I'm not comforted by by the by the response. So I appreciate it, though. Okay. Uh, so just just so you understand, there are live employees in the store. Um, who who report to people who are based in the area, live people. And it's it's not automated that way. Like you, like you, like I have the same issue with, this, with Xfinity. I overpay. I can never get somebody on the line. Um, that's not the case here. <laughs> um, Commissioner, if, 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 if by chance I can jump sure, in, I'd like to address a couple of concerns that came up. Um. The, the, some of the reasons why other things didn't work here and and you know and let's talk about residential let's talk about assisted living let's talk about these other opportunities this property is landlocked when you guys say and you go oh this property faces the park it's part of the park it's integral to the park let's go back to when david lynch abby specter and david crane were running the township and when the bridge got wiped out in 2010, the reason that they were the township refused to put the bridge back was because they told me that the park is the park and everything across the other side is not ours. And the, at that point in time, the township did not see the integration of the rink and the park. We fought with the township immensely about getting the bridge back. At the same time, we fought with them about the loss of parking when they built the skate park. So when we go back decades now and we look at certain aspects of this, I understand the philosophy may be different. It, I don't recognize a lot of faces here <laughs> as things have changed. One of the things that, that when you really look at this site, the site faces the back of a shopping center. It faces all the dumpsters for that shopping center. It faces the back of an office building and it faces a Pico substation. So on three sides, those are the elements. The fourth side is the train tracks. Those are 1900 catenary poles that are rusted and deteriorated that somebody would look out to. So when we looked at this from a multifamily standpoint, that's the view, okay? Um, going back to one of the issues on the back of the building and the neighbors across the street, okay? My cousin lives on that street. That street is also almost 70 feet higher than the railroad tracks. There's an outcrop there of rocks that's 70 feet up. Those people, if they, if they walk all the way out to their backyard and look down, the, down that thing, yes, they'll see it. But they're not going to see that building from their homes. Okay? I've been there. Um, th you know, th this property is, is, is stretched. We have beaten this thing trying to find alternative uses, alternative people, and everything under the sun. The reason that, the reason that Michael Yanoff and another group came in from Florida to talk about putting self-storage here is the only people that seem to want to invest any money here is self-storage. And, and if you visit the site and you look at what you see, it isn't a pretty picture to say, oh, I'm going to build townhomes here and sell, you know, $250,000 townhomes. It doesn't work. So please go ahead. I just wanted to clarify those things. I, I appreciate, I appreciate the response. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Commissioner Rapport. Okay, thanks. Um, and it's a little less organized here because a lot of the points that um, and questions I was going to make already were made. Uh, just let me start by saying to Mr. Pulley, um, one familiar face I think is our attorney, Mr. Bagley, and um, I, you know, I'm sure he remembers uh, some of those um, issues that you raised. Um, so let me start out with some questions and then I'll make some comments at the end. Um, uh, let me, and not in any particular order. Um, I think one of you mentioned that it will be privately secured. Um, what is the security? What are the hours planned for um, the security, uh, for the uh, uh, facility? Is it open 24 seven? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. How does that so work? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not, I didn't mean to cut you off. My apologies. Um, standard hours of operation are generally 7 to 7.30 a.m. to roughly 9.30 to 10 p.m. It's not 24 access. The site is fenced as well in the back. Um, so it's secured. 
access codes, locks, you know, it's, it's a secure facility. I mean, it's certainly not Fort Knox, um, but it's more secure than a retail development would be and an apartment development would be. You can't get in without an access code. It's, it's monitored 24 seven via video. Um, and there's motion sensors, lights on the exterior. Uh, I, I know somebody said that there would be no demand on the township, but um, you know, of course, of course, there would be uh, regular maintenance and security kinds of issues. Um, but all right, um, thank you for addressing that. Um, and um, of course, you know that would be stipulated. I guess that it wouldn't be a twenty-four-seven. Um, Kind of thing. I that that would be a condition, I suppose, sure. uh, that would be asked in, of the zoning hearing board uh, approval for any variances or something like that. Perhaps I, you know, just a thought. Um, the um, let me let me just go through some of these things. Um, on the riparian corridor, the riparian area. As I saw the design, and I couldn't quite make it out, um, the building is, it's the overhang, it is overhanging the access. Is that, is that correct? So that that's part yeah, that's of correct. the covered parking that is um, over the, what you're calling the, oh, well, it's already impermeable um, gravel and pavement anyway. So you're just adding, you are adding an additional cover to that, so it's not really out in the in the fresh air, so to speak, right? So it has an additional coverage over that area. Yeah, the the uh, second, third, and fourth floors would extend over that area. So in that sense, and it is an additional roof over it. So it is not the same condition of impermeable, it is an added layer in a sense that uh, even if uh, presumably you could try to make permeable pavement because of the roof, it, that's, a, you know, that's just a, a myth, right? Well, um, the, the water that beams. falls on the roof would be directed to the detention system, so. Um, right, but it's not like, it, it's, it's not quite what, what, how you presented it, it's not, Oh well, it's already impermeable. No, really, uh, gravel that's exposed to the elements can be permeable, and access ways can be permeable. Uh, but in your case, they're not, right? I just want to make sure I, I understand would, that. I, and I, and what I my response to that would be um, certainly different zoning ordinances treat gravel in different ways. Um, but the reality for what is out here today is that that area where we are talking about is gravel and it is that kind of impermeable surface today. And to James's point, if we have a roof there, um, we can capture that instead of it sheet flowing directly into that creek, we can capture it and do things with it to reduce runoff rate and improve the condition of that water. And if the current owner had been interested in any improvements that could have already been done with impermeable pavement or other other kinds of things. So, all right, thank you for answering that. Um, the uh, parking spaces, um, is it uh, best practice for those parkings or storage to be the size of automobiles or uh, more of the size of vans? And if, for example, if nine of them were, were actually used at one time, does that allow side entrance to, you know, are they large enough? Are they calculated to be wide enough parking spaces so that people can actually bring things out of the sides? You know, presumably you're bringing a, a heavy load or at least certain kinds of things for storage, things like furniture and boxes. So you might want access to the sides. So I'm asking about the width and how that's calculated, if that's any different uh, in terms of the calculations for this kind of project, for the parking that's calculated. So um, I'll, let, I'll let Shimon speak to the, um, the width question in a moment, but I do wanna clarify that the way that the parking is laid out currently, there are um, both 
typical um, parking stalls that you would that the township would typically require uh, for vehicles. But additionally, I think it's one, two, five of those stalls are extra long. Um, so they are designed, part of the parking design is to accommodate um, a larger vehicle uh, or a, a small uh, truck or van that might pull in. Additionally, the drive aisle is 30 feet wide. So when, they, when they're looking at laying out the parking area, they are taking into account that question of you know, how uh, somebody who's, who's coming in and perhaps a U-Haul van, for example, uh, who may be moving and is temporarily storing a larger amount of stuff, is there a space for them to pull in? Yes, there's a space for them to pull in that doesn't require that they take up um, you know, more than one parking space to do so. But that's five out of the 11? That's five and out of the- those are not the handicap. Those are not the, the handicap parking. We're talking about what the length. We're also not talking about the width here. Right, well, and as I said, uh, Shimon can answer as to, to whether or not width okay. has ever been an issue for them. My Wi-Fi was cutting out in the first part of the question, if you don't mind repeating it. Well, I'm, I'm asking about um, the, the sideways entrance and exit of property that's going into storage. Are the, are the parkings all calculated to take into account uh, the vehicles going, you know, with a haul to, to go into storage? Are, are they wide enough? Are they calculated? to get enough of the wider spaces in so that say if, if many of them are occupied, uh, there's no, no conflict with the, the van or the car next door, next to you, you know, so that you have enough actual space to do the job. Sure, um, so the parking, it's certainly wide enough to, to accommodate, to answer your question. So are they, they're wider than a standard parking? I, I don't know the measurements. Maybe, maybe our building, uh, you know, and, and other folks. Yeah, I, I, to, to, be, to be honest, I don't know the exact width. Myself. Yeah, and the part I, I think it's important that they're, I, I need, I, I would like some reassurance that they are not your standard automobile parking sizes, that they are calculated yeah. as oversized. So, so they are, um, John, if you can address yes. that, I, I believe they're to the size for a box truck. Yes, that they, they are. And then we are, we are showing, um, as Amy referenced, there are oversized parking stalls um, and there are stalls that are 28 and a half feet in depth uh, where 18 is typically required. So we do have that. And in addition, uh, you know, I, I guess I would just ask Shimon, I, I would say you've developed these facilities before with stalls at these dimensions and in this configuration. Um, so there is, uh, this developer isn't someone who's doing this for the first time. It's something where these have been done before and built before. Correct. Well, and to address that point a, a little bit, most of the people who are going to be coming, a lot of times are gonna be in a smaller U-Haul um, there, these spots are big enough for, I believe the term is an SU-30. It's rare that you see that just by the way these units are designed and sizes. There are very limited units that can actually accommodate. Um, the, how, let me rephrase that. There's very few units that are big enough that you would need a truck that large. Um, so most of the vehicles are going to be pickup trucks, smaller cars. Some of these are 25 square feet total. So you're really, you shouldn't, we should not be running into that issue. We've never run into that issue yet. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, I know, you know, you know, you know, storage, the question was the calculation for this proposal where you're trying to squeeze in uh, enough uh, parkings to try to, uh, muster up a variance argument. So, and so the question sure, was, so really, I, Sure. So I don't think it's going to be a. Sure. So I don't think it's going to be a squeeze um, per se. You know, as Paul testified, you know, the average was eleven people there at any given time. If there were eleven people at this facility at any given time, well, I'd be truck, the happiest man alive. Vehicles. 11 right. I'm, vehicles. I'm sorry. Eleven vehicles. I'd be the happiest man alive. 
it doesn't happen. You know, usually when someone goes, there's maybe one other vehicle there. Um, there's plenty of space and which is why 11 is kind of the maximum. Generally, you'll see two vehicles there, you know, on a busy time, maybe three. And, and frankly, at least one of those vehicles will be a sedan pickup truck. Okay. Now, um, somebody was talking about um, what I was hoping I would hear as a demand study, but apparently your, your uh, publicly traded company has done all your demand studies. But the 10%, you'd be happy with 10% of what you called, somebody called 200,000 people within a three mile radius. And with Cheltenham having about 37,000 people, um, and you're counting on a, a service area of 200,000 people, um, I, I'm just curious, uh, you know, uh, we, we are nine square miles. And where's all um, this traffic coming from? Uh, well, it isn't right. just so, where is it coming from? It's it's how does that serve a variance for Cheltenham Township uh, welfare? I don't I don't hear that. Okay, so so I'll address that point. Um, you know, the three miles is is three miles in all directions. So it does include outside Cheltenham Township, which I you know which would be I guess part of your concern. Um, if you're saying no, that no, Township Cheltenham is already nine square miles and you're kind of in the middle of it. So, um, <laughs> again, I, goes into I, I, don't, I don't hear it. Well, it does. It, it tends towards towards to go to that Philadelphia area. Um, you know, also to, to address the point, you know, my math may be off here T 10%. Uh, our users, if there's 37,000 people, um, that's 3,700. Um, we have about 1,200 units here. Um, so we're re really looking at, you know, about 5%. Re we really need about half of the average percentage of renters to make this facility full. Uh, from I, again, I, I'm not hearing the numbers that are serving uh, a variance uh, argument, but... Um you know, in terms of use variance for our zoning code and our planning and the welfare of, as uh, Commissioner Armand said, the character and the intent of the zoning plan um, that is uh, for our, um, you know, economic goals as well as our, um, uh, the uh, benefit of our taxpayers. Um, let me, let me mention um, and ask about, uh, you all have talked about the, in a sense, the architecture of the wall facing uh, the SEPTA um, tracks. One of the things that struck me is that um, there is a, a serious economic impact on the township as far as image and perception um, to commuters. If Cheltenham is going to be a destination and an economic attraction for our real estate, for our commercial um, entities, um, one of the things that is of concern is that, uh, you know, your, your facility would be probably a couple hundred feet from historic wall house and um, just down the block, uh, Old York Road of a major national uh, historic landmark in terms of architecture. So you've got two major uh, historic sites that are pro prominent in terms of architectural features and um, and frankly, you've hired one of the best law firms in the region. So I agree completely. You know, when I heard when I heard financially stretching, um, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced. I I think the the 
the depiction that I saw, even, even the added uh, architectural interest or the mural, uh, I, you got to do better than that. Um, I, I, I just, that, that's an, to me, it looked like an atrocity. I, the skating rink from the train tracks, frankly, was much more interesting and much more uh, conducive to people wanting to have an interest in Cheltenham than, than what I saw there. Uh, but I, I, you know, that's just a comment. That isn't really a question. Let me, let me make sure I'm, I'm addressing some of the other questions. Um, all right, maybe oh, we can well, if that does, something. let me, let me, what? We're, we're trying to know. see if we can get this toward a conclusion. And uh, you're well, making very good, couple, you're making very good points, I'm, Commissioner. I just want to try I'm to, trying to move, get through them. I'm trying to move fast, uh, but, but there's a lot. Um, yeah, the question on that, and I don't even need an answer right now because I know you're going to be going on uh, to the next stage. But so part of the issue was if you're going to have a green screen to try to prohibit um, or reduce graffiti on there. Um, we've seen uh, presentations for green screens. And one of the issues is maintenance. One of the issues is uh, seasonal maintenance, things like that. So, and, and we've, we've seen a lot of discouraging information about that. So I just uh, thought I'd, I'd mention that and you can take that question uh, further on. So um, I'll Kathy, address that another, point. Sorry, go ahead. Right? Uh, I'm just going to save well. time and let you do that at the zoning hearing. <laughs> no, I'll take 20 seconds if, you, right. if you'll indulge me. So that, that part is actually included in the extra cost that I was referring to. There is maintenance um, and it's seasonal to, to your point. So it's not just the cost of actually putting it on it. It's also, it's also the cost of maintaining it as well, which is adding to the cost. Again, that, that is a, you know, a kind of a covenant type question. Uh, you know, a condition that, uh, you know, if you need variances on stuff, uh, you know, those would be conditions I would think that this board would, would expect. Um, have you asked Elkins Park Square um, about an agreement for um, different access to the property? And I, I ask that in two ways. Um, one for the proposed storage, but uh, otherwise, I would ask originally for, or you know, or for any other use, because it might be that they're not eager to you to give you access uh, for one use, but they would be for a um, use that didn't require uh, a variance. Um, and I can certainly speak to that. Um, there are there are two agreements in place relative to that existing. Uh, access point there. One is an easement that is recorded uh, in favor of the ice rink that is specific to the Zamboni and ice chips. Right. Obviously, we don't have Zambonis and ice chips, so that easement would be extinguished uh, at the time at which the property transfers and there's no longer an ice rink there. Um, I did get a call today from Peter Friedman, who represents uh, the uh, Elkins, uh, Elkins Park Square Shopping Center, um, we did talk about the secondary agreement. There is an agreement in place uh, that was, that was um, executed at the time that the redevelopment authority actually still held what is now Elkins Park Square. Um, and that agreement was between the redevelopment authority, the ice rink and the township. And it allowed for limited service and um, emergency access uh, at, that look, at that point. So at the, at the juncture point between the two properties. Uh, the the um, owner of the shopping center indicated to Peter that she had spoken to the fire marshal. He has taken a look at this and he does not believe that emergency access is necessary along there. Um, and as a result, she's asked that that agreement be, um, be uh, voided in its entirety if the sale does go through. The, the shopping center is very interested in eliminating any kind of access along that, um, that location there. Um, they're concerned about folks moving back and forth between there. They're concerned right. about people parking um, on, on their shopping center and, and um, accessing you know, somebody else's property, et cetera, et cetera. So she wants to see it go away entirely. Um, and we've, we have said that 
as long as the fire marshal agrees that we don't need um, emergency access there, this user has no objection to doing that. I don't know if she would have a different opinion uh, if it was something else. Um, and, and that is really to the point that I, I'm saying, I, I would think that a compatible use that's consistent with mixed use um, that would be attractive and compatible with that shopping center might really uh, benefit from access. And that uh, I don't know that, that we can argue that the access isn't available if we haven't come up with a compatible, uh, consistent use with our zoning code and a, in a sense, a friendlier use uh, that, that would, uh, would invite such a cooperative kind of effort. Um, but I, I heard some pressure from uh, my chair, and so I'm going to try to to wrap my part up real quick. Um, I, I'll just make a couple of other comments and stop with the questions at this point. Um, I would say that highest and best use is not is not necessarily the same thing as a hardship. And the fact that this is the best you could come up with, I'm not convinced that this, and I understand what you did explore, um, but I, I still think that there are, are other types of uses. And, and frankly, um, I've heard inconsistencies. Oh, we're financially stretched. Oh, we're, we're doing all we possibly can. Uh, but but that's not consistent with your publicly traded company and the, the quality of the law firm and all the other things. So I, I'm hearing two contradictory themes here. And, and it, it frankly, it, it takes away from the credibility of the project. Um, I, I would- If, if I could address that point, the, the, the management, the, the management company, they get paid off of revenue. Right. It is not caught, meaning if we come in and we don't lease a single unit, they don't make any money. Um, so it's not about us paying them. It's them taking money from us um, off of the revenue as their management fee, like any other management company would, um, whether it's an apartment or, or, or in a, a warehouse or whatever that may be. OK, um, in, in terms of in terms of the arguments for your uh, somebody gave the fiscal impact. I, you know, I think that was kind of ludicrous, uh, you know, to, to give me the fiscal impact compared to a, in a property that really hasn't been improved in, uh, you know, a decade or so. Uh, and I mean, you know, any, there was also an argument about, um, I, you know, the, this alternative ways to do a new build and um, to compare, um, I, it was something about uh, that you couldn't accommodate. Uh, I, oh, uh, 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 another kind of recreational thing because you've got structural beams. Well, nobody's going to use the current uh, a, a new a new sports indoor sports arena uh, that maybe has tennis courts, pickleball courts, uh, <laughs> uh, racket racket whatever it wants. Uh, you know, a multiple uses and more consistent with uh, a mixed use kind of thing. Um, they're going to rebuild from scratch. They're not going to use the current arena. So, you know, again, there, there were too many arguments here that weren't, weren't really uh, logical to me. And, and I guess I'll, I'll just end with two, two other things. I would invite whoever is still left here at this meeting from the public um, this is a multi-stage um, discussion. Our recommendation, I'm, this is just informative. Our recommendation tonight, uh, I guess, goes to our legislative uh, meeting on the 17th, but then eventually it goes, it, well, actually it doesn't. It, it go, this would, our recommendation will go to the zoning hearing board. And that is scheduled to meet, I think on March 8th, unless uh, uh, a change is made. So turn out at the, if you're interested in making, uh, you know, your comments heard to the deciding body, that is March 8th. 
Um, and I just, again, the, the issue to me is uh, we, we, you know, every project deserves a right to present its variances, requests, you know, its requests and its, its concerns and, and why it feels that it deserves um, a, a special uh, treatment. But I think the township has an obligation, not necessarily to accept every variance that comes its way, but to weigh the economic benefit to the township for those exceptions, for those changes, for those uh, really dramatic um, externalities that do have impact on us uh, that are more than financial, that have to do with image, have to do with the quality of life, have to do with our historic character. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rappaport. I appreciate all your comments, Irv. I'm going to get to you in a second. Uh, I just want to thank you, Commissioner Rappaport, but next time I hope you think this through a little more thoroughly. I think you might have missed a question. <laughs> Irv, there's at least one I question. I miss a few. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is at least one question left for you. Go ahead. I do know she did get pickleball in there, though. Now, I knew that was going to come in there somewhere. Pickleball was coming. Um, I have one really simple question. Um, you said your time for the um, for this thing was 7 a.m. to like 9 p.m. ish, but you mentioned an access card. So as a customer, do I have access to go to my storage bin 24-7? Having the access code? Shimon, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, the answer is no, it's not 24 access. So I should have clarified that. So the office hours are about nine to six. The access to the facility, you know, is about that seven to 7.30 to about nine, 9.30, 10 p.m. You need the access code to get into the building, whether an employee is in the building or not. The access code will not work past those, you know, before 7 a.m. And, and after 10 p.m. It will not let you an access code will not work. Okay, I thought it was 24 seven. All right, thank you, that's all I had. And all right, I'm gonna wrap this up by making a simple statement. I agree that this is a destination location. I don't think you're looking for 300,000 cars going past you every day, but I disagree that this is the best to come, be come up with because if you wanna stay in the same kind of single use large building, I wouldn't care if you were suggesting a bowling alley, an arcade, uh, a pizza parlor, things that would be destination oriented, uh, that would be more, I'd say culturally appealing to the neighborhood. Uh, you know, even if it was we're giving up an ice rink, but we're getting a bowling alley, I think people would be more willing to accept something like that than storage. I will tell you in conclusion, because I really do want to conclude this. Normally I would then throw this to the commissioner of the ward. In this case, that's me. <laughs> I happen to tell, I have to tell you that I am averse to this. I don't think that storage is a good addition to the community. I don't think it's a good neighbor to the park. And that if this does go to the zoning hearing board, I will ask the board to approve council representing us there in, in aversion to this. And being the nearest neighbor other than Elkins Park Square uh, within that 500 foot radius, I will ask our township manager to represent us. And I will also appear there. I do not feel this is a healthy addition. Uh, I think it's well presented. Uh, like I said, it's the best silk purse I've seen, but I really don't think this is gonna help us in this community. And Mr. Pulley, just so you know, I will work with you and your representation any way I can to help you come up with a better project, but I just don't think this is the one. I wanna thank you all for coming. I'm gonna open this up for any public comment that might be there. Uh, Alice, is there any citizens who wanna to speak to this? Because I saw a lot of people earlier. It was two hours. Yeah, yeah. I see yes. uh, Dan George. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, confused about one thing um, based upon the information that was provided in the agenda uh, documents. 
um, as to the company itself. Um, my understanding is that this is, this is proposed by uh, PV Asset Management uh, LLC. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Are you asking me or the applicants? Uh, whoever can speak Sorry, to that. I think we were all trying to unmute at the same time. Yeah, so PV, PV Asset Management is the single purpose entity that gets created uh, for the purchase and operation. Hoverney Shake is the, um, the overall um, company that develops this type of project. Okay, the reason I asked the question is because in looking up the, um, and this is the one out of Baltimore, correct? Correct. Okay. In looking up the uh, registration of that entity uh, in the Baltimore Business Express, which is a governmental uh, registry, um, I noted that the uh, uh, resident agent, Eugene uh, Perverni, uh, is behind on filing of uh, personal property taxes in, for three consecutive years. I was just wondering if someone could speak to that. I'm not really sure what that has to do with zoning, quite frankly. Um, there's you're, you know, you're correct in that, Ms. Farrell. I understand your concern, Mr. George, but I don't think the people here could speak to that issue one way or the other. Okay, so the reason for raising that question is um, it, whatever the, the use case is that's being requested, it matters who's doing the requesting. And I didn't know if anybody on the board or any of the people here presenting today were aware of that fact. And secondly, uh, if they were, if they had an explanation for it, but all, you know, all, all the other points that I would have asked about have already been covered by other people. Thank you. Yep. I got a couple more and I want to queue them up. Bonnie, I believe your hand was up next and Rhonda and I see Bill is here and Gabriel is here. So let's try to get them in that order. That's how they popped up. Bonnie. Thanks, Commissioner Pransky. I um, am also in your ward. I'm right around the corner. I've lived in the township for close to 50 years and I've seen a lot of changes, especially in that area in this intersection in question, the York Road and historic areas of church road that we're discussing and i don't want to extend this meeting any longer than we have to i just want to voice my opinion that i am not in favor of this project either um for all of the reasons that you and commissioner um Araman outlined outlined so let that be on the record please thank you Bonnie. you're uh, welcome Rhonda, thank I, think, you. I think you were next Rhonda. Rhonda's napping. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Forgive me. I, <laughs> I just forgot to unmute myself. Um, I, I made my points pretty clear at the Planning Commission and my concerns about this project. And um, just to voice, like many of the commissioners, I too received um, more messages and communication about this project because of social media. Um, and they're pretty much are right in line with what Commissioner Pransky said um, and their concern about a destination seems to be what the community um, is supporting. So I just wanted to add that point. And then that was my, that, that was my concern on my um, absten abstention vote on the Planning Commission. I have real concerns about putting this kind of project in the middle of that uh, neighborhood. I think we can do better. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, Bill, I think you were up next. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Pransky. I am. Uh, I would agree that this is really, you know, we're trying to promote Cheltenham as a destination, not just this lot, but as a good place to live and to work. And a lot of uh, effort has been put in to try to reinvigorate different parts of the community. And I'm afraid of putting a four-story warehouse uh, next to the park right off of Old York Road really doesn't keep with that. I, I have great concerns about the size of the building. I have concerns about the location of the building. I understand and, and can appreciate the owner of the property's uh, situation of wanting to do something there. 
Uh, I do not believe that a self storage place uh, is is best for for our community. And I do actually have one question: How many people do you think will live in this structure? Uh, because that is a thing. Uh, if there's access at seven in the morning until nine thirty at night, and there's bathrooms in the facility, how many people do you expect will live in there? Um, the, the, the answer is zero. Um, there's full-time employees there. The entire facility is camera monitored. So they will see if that happens. They also had security access, Bill. They did mention that. Yeah, and you have a card to get in after seven in the morning. Okay, I, I, I hear you. I, I'm not here to argue. Um, I don't think this is right for our community. And uh, I'm fairly disappointed that we're this far down the road about even considering this. Um, and I hope that it... Uh, I hope we can figure out something better for that site. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Gabriel, I think you're next. Hello. So with regards to the, to the, the neighbors across the tracks um, and, and above that neighborhood, the houses there are two and three stories tall. And I want to see if you've done any uh, studies on the visual impact from that side of the development and how much taller is the new building going to be than the existing skating rink? If that was already addressed, perhaps we can move on. Yeah. I thank you for your question, though. Um, so I, I, did, I do just want to, I can confirm for you there, sure. that, that, that 45 feet that we're proposing is an allowable height in the MU district. So we're not asking for relief to exceed the 45 foot limit. So anything that get built that gets built there can be built up to that 45 foot height. Thank you. I'm going to close comment at this point. I think the sentiments are understood. And Henry, see, I didn't ask, I ask you once. Um, I am going to make a motion to oppose this. And if that is acceptable to the Board of Commissioners, I'm going to recommend that both uh, Township Council and Township Manager represent us if it does move forward to the zoning hearing board. I'll second the motion and also endorse our township solicitor um, uh, attending the meeting to represent our case in opposition. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Ms. Farrell, you have your answer. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Believe it or not, we're now up to item two. <laughs> uh, item two is received the planning commission meeting minutes. I did not see anything that required further discussion from there at this point. Anybody have any questions about that? Then I'm going to move to receive it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Item three, review of the zoning hearing board decisions. And Henry, this is when you're up. And I noticed that the meeting has shrunk tremendously after that. <laughs> uh, item A is appeal number 20-3657, Varnum Palai uh, for 403 East Glenside Avenue. Henry, enlighten us. Yes, again, this was before uh, the building and, planning, uh, building and zoning committee. Uh, uh, a lot of comments came out of that meeting. Uh, the uh, Zoning Hearing Board took them into consideration, uh, but the uh, the appeal, the request for relief was approved by the Zoning Hearing Board and uh, with some conditions, uh, but it's it's basically in the Just appeal remind stage. Just remind us of the project, Henry. So. Oh, the project involves uh, construction or addition of a, an, adi uh, an additional unit or a couple of units to, to this property. Um, and I believe, as part of the uh, review by the zoning here by the uh, board, uh, there was a request to have uh, signage incorporated uh, into into the uh, into the, uh, the the proposed use, in addition to uh, use of impervious coverage or impervious uh, coverage or impervious surface. I'm sorry, it's kind of late. I'm kind of stumbling through my words. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, uh, I'm used, again, I'm it was the last minute meeting myself, but go ahead. <laughs> it was a conversion of an existing <laughs> dwelling from a duplex to a three family dwelling. Uh, Commissioner Araman, this is in your ward, I believe. It, it is. And uh, and to Mr. Sekawangu's point, we, um, 
we had um, uh, requested certain conditions um, that the zoning hearing board take into consideration, that being the pervious pavers, as well as signage about a hidden driveway. They indeed did. Um, and with that, I would recommend no action, um, no further action by the board on this. There's a motion for no action. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item B. Appeal number 20-3660, Richard Nevis for 317 Cheltenham Avenue. There was much discussion on that, I believe. Uh, Mr. Sakawango, please refresh yes, our you. memories. It was all so long ago now. Sure, this was uh, this is in Dan uh, Norris's ward. Um, again, as part of the uh, discussion by the Building and Zoning yeah. Committee uh, on this uh, construction of a structure without any building approvals or zoning approval, the board opted to have the zoning, I mean, the uh, township solicitor attend the meeting. And as a result of that, um, that attendance by the township solicitor, the board uh, rendered a decision that the presenter, Mr. Nevius, had no standing and uh, also um, denied our, uh, the requested relief for this. Thank you. Appeal. And a gold star for Mr. Bagley. Um, the, we, we, we have to take no action. I mean, it was denied, so I think we can just accept that and move on. Uh, item 3C, appeal number 20-3661, Arcadia University for 450 Southeastern Road. And Mr. Segawango, should we bundle that with uh, the next one also? Or Yes, they're in, uh, one is, the first one is in uh, Commissioner Holland's uh, ward. Uh, the other one is in Commissioner Armand's uh, ward. Again, uh, the the zoning was grant the zoning relief granted um, the zoning relief was granted by the zoning hearing board uh, with conditions uh, as stated in the uh, in the in the order commissioner Rappaport has a question yeah thank you I, I think are we on as part of what you were lumping together uh, D the, um, yeah the, CND. CND. C and D C and D so my question is about D, um, the, the physical therapy and the commercial. The, the way I read the decision of the Zoning Hearing Board, um, it was approving it as only an educational use. And the way I heard the presentation this is a commercial use. There was gonna be a commercial, uh, an addition of a commercial physical therapy um, uh, practice it was going to then give some uh, mentorship to some of the students. And my concern is um, the way it was written, you know, I, I don't have a problem with a commercial physical therapy group there, but I, you know, then you, you expect business taxes and that came up in our discussion. So when they say as was presented, you know, in uh, the zoning hearing or testimony under oath, um, you know, getting again, double talk, you know, when it's convenient to say, yeah, it's a commercial establishment, we get it in one breath, and then it goes to the zoning hearing board and somehow they have a different impression and a different outcome because that's a condition. And I wanna know who's gonna monitor whether that's a commercial entity or an educational entity. And I'm, I'm not real comfortable with the way that came off I don't know what the uh, testimony really sounded like at the zoning hearing board, but you know, I have some remaining concerns about no, that. No, I think that's an excellent point, Commissioner, and I was not, oh, not as enlightened as you are on this when, when that one came up. Uh, Henry, if it is in fact a commercial venture, if it is a, a, a physical well, therapy facility as opposed to just you know, a classroom educational setting, uh, it changes a lot of things, including being commercial. It's certainly not a nonprofit piece of property at that point. It's a commercial enterprise. Um, and has that been considered on this? Um, what I can do is share the testimony. Uh, we do have the transcripts uh, from the hearing. I can send it out to the board. Uh, my VPN is not working, so I, I can't do it tonight, but I'll, I'll be sure to send it out in the morning. And uh, I, know, I know that there is a time frame that if we're gonna appeal or ask for some kind of, I don't know, verification process or whatever, there's a time limit. And I don't know what that is and I don't know how fast or, you know, what, 
you know, I think this is an area where we could probably use some expert advice. I don't know to what extent my reading of the transcript is really going to give us the answer we need fast enough. Uh, I saw Mr. Bagley inhale, so he's probably going to opine. Good. We have That's 30, the idea. We have 30 days from when the findings of fact and conclusions of law are issued. So Henry, I don't have them in front of me, but if you can tell us the date of the findings of fact and conclusions of law, we have 30 days from there to take an appeal. Yeah, the, the board basically just did an order. They didn't do any findings of fact. So this particular order right now as dated um, uh, that was sent out on the 10th marks the start of uh, the start of that 30 day period. So technically this expires the, the uh, relief period or the time frame for uh, filing um, a motion would be the end of uh, the Mar March 10th, basically. Is, is it, I'm sorry, Henry, the date of the order is the 8th, but it's mailed out on the 10th. Correct. Um, so the the time runs from the date it's mailed or the date of the actual order? The date of the actual order. Uh, so that's the 8th. So that would be the 8th. So if we want to take an appeal of this, we have until approximately March 8th. So we're just, you're going to have to act on it tonight. It's Monday. If now, I, now I don't say there's, there's two parts to this. That's the zoning part. That doesn't stop you from questioning this from the tax point of view. If you subsequently learn that what's going on there is a commercial use, because you could challenge it on a tax basis, regardless of that appeal date. Mr. Bagley, um, are we hamstringing ourselves in any way if we said, okay, we don't have a zoning problem with this if they want to put up a facility, but we definitely have a problem that it's not as we felt it was presented and it is more commercial than educational. Are by allowing the one, are, are we in any way shortening our ability to challenge them and say, you know, we didn't mind a facility, we just mind you calling it educational if it's commercial. I don't think so. I would check the transcript to make sure that the testimony bears that up. But if it was presented as an educational use, I don't think we we waive anything by saying we don't have a problem with the, the zoning part of it. The problem we have is as you operate it, it's actually sounding like it's being operated as commercial use as opposed to educational. And there we, we have a tax issue with it. Then I'm, well, I'm Mr. Step, Bagley, hang, I'm hang sorry. on both of you for one second. Yeah. I'm going to separate C and D. I take back what I said earlier. So yeah. we, can, we, can, we can clear one and stick with the other. Is there any other questions about C, which was, Henry, tell us one more time so when everybody's clear. I would, I would move no action for C. Okay. <laughs> There's a motion for no action on C. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any more confusion? I am. Okay. D, we'll stick with that one. I know that Commissioner Araman had something to say, and just I, I just have a question for uh, Solicitor Bagley. Um, it, it, in that vein, what you just just described, we don't have a necessarily a zoning issue, but at some point in the future, after this is built, we recognize, hey, maybe there's a commercial use here. What are what are the mechanics for um, addressing that concern? Um, they're already tax exempt, so we would have to challenge their tax exemption. So we would have to file an application with the Board of Assessment when we have some evidence of how they're actually operating that use. Okay, thank you. Commissioner uh, Rapport, go ahead. And I'm sorry to, to dwell on this, but I mean, we were all no, there No, you are then. not. <laughs> go ahead. We, we were all there for the presentation and it sound to us, not, not to the Zoning Hearing Board, uh, you know, it sounded pretty clear to me. I don't, I don't know how the rest of you felt that that what is already going on there is somewhat ambiguous as to how much of it is actually um, uh, commercial versus educational. And I thought that they acknowledged that this was, you know. So th I'm concerned about the contradiction as well as the. Um, you know, the I, I agree with you, Commissioner. How, how we actually, and it goes, you know, Matt, you, you also were saying, how do we actually get to the facts about how they're operating? 
And I don't think we've established that. We may not be able to establish that tonight. It may be something our attorney wants to talk about it offline. I don't know, or maybe uh, the code folks or the folks in, in the zoning office. I don't know. That's though an, an ongoing thing. It isn't just after it gets built, but it's both. Um, I, I think the first question I would have is, do they charge for the services rendered at that building? Now, if so, that's not strictly educational. If it's just a teaching environment, you know, sort of an on-a-job training, then they're not running a commercial enterprise. They are using it for teaching and training. I can probably swallow that one, but if they're charging for it, not so much. It's more complicated because you can charge at an educational medical, you know, you can still be getting an internship or, a, you know, it's not that straightforward. And that's the concern I have. Okay. Uh, we had Eric Layton on the call until about 30 seconds ago. And he, <laughs> he checked off. off. And he's one of the signatories. Uh, yeah, he knew when to run. <laughs> Uh, he, saw, he saw the handwriting on the wall. I, I heard Irv had mentioned something about a question, but I think he's hiding right now. I don't see him. Yeah. Lo we've lost him from the meeting at the moment. Uh, Commissioner Armin. Yeah, Joe, Joe, do you have a suggestion on how we how we deal with this? I, I think, uh, why don't you authorize uh, an appeal if necessary? But in the meantime, Henry and I will look at the transcript and see if the transcript probably doesn't even go into the level of detail we're talking about. So unless there's something revealing in the transcript, we will not take an appeal. But if there is something that talks about things like charges, usage, if it gets into that level of detail, and I think that there's something in there where we are waiving it by not taking an appeal, you at least will have provisionally authorized an appeal that I could take by the 8th. That makes sense. Okay. I don't believe there was any discussion on that uh, as part of the zoning hearing board. I, I, that, I wouldn't that think there was, but you and I, Henry, can check it right. to make sure there's nothing in there like that. All Mr. right. So Mr. there Mr. is. Chairman? Yeah. Oh, certainly, Mr. Zenkowski. Maybe if I could just suggest maybe a little softer approach. How about just a phone call to the university and ask them just what's going a on? After the, after the earlier presentation, why should we be so nice? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just, you've got a university that's in your community and it would be just a lot easier just to call them and say, what, what are you doing there? And if, you know, instead of taking the hard line approach to them to say, we're gonna come after you legally and that just a quick phone call and say, what are, you gonna, what are you doing there? Here's the concern of the township. And, and if they're gonna do that, I just think you want to be able to build a relationship with the Commissioner union. Norris is going to jump in in a second. Commissioner yeah. Armin, That's if awful. that is what occurs, are you going to participate? Are you uh, going I'd to be, want to participate? Uh, I'd be happy to, yeah. yeah. Excellent suggestion, Bob. Yes, excellent suggestion, Matt. Thanks for helping. Okay. Thanks, um, so there is a motion for conditional confusion followed by the possibility of representation in an appeal. <laughs> It sounds like you're going to authorize an appeal after discussion by Mr. Sekowongo, me, Commissioner Armin, Mr. Ziankowski. Okay, what he said. Uh, all in favor? Aye, aye. aye. <laughs> Thank That's you. Terrific. Okay. I hope this is an easy one. E, appeal number 20-3663, St. Paul's Episcopal Church for 537-555 Ashburn Road. Apparently, the neighbors in the cemetery are complaining about something, Henry? Yeah, this is in- uh, Oh, come on guys, that was supposed to be humor. Commissioner. <laughs> stay awake, stay <laughs> awake. <laughs> this was in Commissioner Zingmanfeld's uh, ward. But uh, again, this was uh, discussed extensively by the committee. Uh, there were sudden concerns raised. Um, and again, the, the zoning hearing board uh, granted the relief conditioned a couple on a couple of, few, uh, couple of things specific to the shared parking agreement, which the township still hasn't received, uh, but anticipate receiving that shortly. And then also um, a couple other conditions that are really more uh, related to the, uh, to the uses. And whose ward is this in Ashburn? That would be my ward. And uh, your recommendation? My recommendation is that they meet the parking conditions before we would, um, before we would, you know, give them a, a green light. But 
no action conditional on them uh, providing the parking agreement information that we had expected. Is that acceptable to everybody? We have a motion. All in favor? All right. Uh, Aye. Okay. By the way, that gives us till the 22nd of March. We have 30 days. That was a February 22nd uh, finding. So now, it's pressed for time here. Yeah, if I, if I may too, uh, we can't, the township will not be issuing any permits on this until we have that shared agreement. So we pretty much have, uh, uh, you know, plenty it'll of time. remain as a no action. So we'll, the yeah, okay. the decision, you know, is good for a year. If they don't, if we don't have anything within the year, the decision goes away. Okay. We are now up to item four, the always infamous report of the building inspector. Anybody have any questions about that? No moved. Okay, it's accepted. Anybody object to that idea? Good. Numbers five, old business. All of it is by now. Any any additional old business? Close old business. Number six, new business. Any new business? Close new business. Number seven, the citizens forum. There I see two citizens, three citizens. Ted, you're unmuted. Do you have something you want yeah, to say? Yeah, uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you guys, or guys, figuratively speaking, for uh, staying so late, you know, to uh, do all this work. Uh, it's it's appreciated by some. I'm well past my meeting a lot. Normally, building, uh, normally, public works finishes about now, so then Brad gets to speed through building and zoning. <laughs> Yeah, I actually exceeded your time tonight, Mitch. You did. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm thoroughly embarrassed by that fact. <laughs> and thank you for your comment, Ted. Anybody else? Going once, twice. Closing Citizens for a motion to adjourn. Aye. All Aye. in favor? Good. Aye. <laughs>